Hi everyone, I'm Wendy Muse, creator of the Left Pocket Project, which brings you the history of leftists of color one swipe at a time. And this is the Left Pocket Project podcast. Uh, Before we get started on today's episode, I just wanted to remind everyone to please check us out on social media by going to at leftpoc, where you can find all of our episodes and general commentary on the things at hand. Um, And also to definitely check out our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash leftpoc. Everything we post there is free and accessible to the public. We include many readings, um, commentary, of course, all of our podcast episodes and additional information. Um, So please be sure to check that out. And of course, while you're there, if you feel so inclined, feel free to give us a dollar or more per month to help us keep all our content free and to keep the podcast and the project itself going. With that said, let's get on with today's episode. Today, Richard and I speak with Yannick Giovanni Marshall. I actually met him, met (laughs) in quotation marks, uh, via the internet, via Twitter, Um, and I was really impressed by many of his takes and commentary and, you know, spoke with him here and there through the DMs and decided, you know what, I really would love to have him on the show to learn more about his work um, and where sort of his worldview comes from. It was super interesting to me, Um, and I think that this episode really gives a nice look at where he's coming from. Um, So anyway, more about him. He currently writes in Black Studies, and he's an assistant professor in Africana Studies at Knox College, where he teaches courses on police power, Black literature, anti-colonialism, and the settler colonial history of Kenya. He's written several op-eds on police violence, nationalism, and white supremacist liberalism. And also, um, I really, just to add to the things that he's written, a lot of his work uh, appears on Al Jazeera, but elsewhere, but um, check it out. It's linked in the show notes. I would highly suggest you all read some of those if you have a chance. Um, It helps sort of expound upon what he discusses in our episode. So with that said, on with the show. Yannick Marshall, thank you so much for being with us today. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I actually learned about your work and about you in general from from Twitter. Um, and I'm always excited when I see like, you know, radical academics and people who study the African diaspora and Africa who are really engaged in politics um, and who are very vocal about their opinion of, you know, what the United States government is doing, um, what the West, what Western governments in general are doing. Um, but one of the things that I found really interesting about your um, pre- you know, your trajectory, your interests and whatnot, is that you often included um, a discussion about Africa and African countries and their specific issues in your discussion of Western empire, which is something that I think is often missing um, in a lot of leftist takes, unfortunately. So could you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how you came to do uh, work initially in Kenya, but then elsewhere, and and how you sort of see the place of Africa on the left um, and the place Uh, for Africa in terms of the fight against imperialism in the present? Um, Well, I've been interested interested in uh, black um, violence, anti-black forms of, anti-black modes of life and world uh, um, a long time. I actually started uh, my my university education doing Caribbean studies, and then I moved to African American studies, and then I ended up in African studies. And so my question was largely the same, which was how does the colonial or set of colonial forms of power affect black people and what were their resistance, what kind of um, resistance literatures, um, languages they've mobilized, et cetera. So I ended up studying Kenya because literally because I was better at Swahili. I'm not good at Swahili, but I'm better I was better at Swahili than Zulu and <laughs> number of other like languages that I had that were made available to me. <clears throat> and I wanted to speak specifically about a set of colonial, um, set of colonial power, because that is um, the Caribbean where I, that was um, what is called Canada and America. Those are places. Um, so I wanted to speak about that specific form of life and, um, uh, I was studying Africa, and um, something where you can see the, the and the rebellion against um, just uh, resistance within the state. Uh, so when the hostile natives or when the indigenous were rebelling against from root to ceiling of the state, 
um, that was a theoretical perspective that I found was important rather than just um, worker struggles within the state. And so I studied um, how I think about Africa on the left. Um, I think of Africa almost even before left. Um, there is obviously leftist movements in, in every African country. Um, there is the uh, like communists and, and socialists and people enacting a number of different uh, workers in subaltern politics. But there's also a clear legacy of anti-colonial um, rebellion um, against the state, and then later on, anti-colonial attempts to remove the state once the state was established. So Africa was has provided a lot of um, uh, rich theor theoretical uh, space to be able to examine our modern colonial problem. Um, it is the central colony in America and the central colonies in Africa that pretty much operate very similar. Um, and so Africa, a number of places in Africa, you can do it obviously in like Haiti, et cetera, but a number of places in, in Africa, the histories of, of Africa, um, specifically what I study, which is um, the history of Nairobi. Um, that history says something about what it means to be able to move against the entire state rather than uh, uh, mobilize to make the state better. That's really interesting because I think your uh, almost like your correction, if you will, of what I was saying is important because I think what you're what you're getting at is there's almost uh like the left part can completely fall out right? It can fall out of the bottom. And yet the whole point is to be fighting against the imperial state, fighting against the colonial state. And that in some ways doesn't necessarily require a specific set of political ideologies, at least at the beginning, right? This is sort of a, a, a universalization, universalization, excuse me, of the fight against colonialism. And what I find interesting is that, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at a place like Eastern Africa, for example, and how that can be applied to the Caribbean, almost if you go in the opposite direction of sorts, right? So if you're looking at more 20th century stuff, how can you apply that to things that have been going on in the Americas since the 16, 17, and 1800s and still come out of it, not necessarily through a specific um, you know, political ideology, but from a place where you're recognizing that there is a certain sovereignty that each state and each group of people has and that needs to be recognized. And that should be something that's, that's first um, before getting to everything else. Um, I wanted you to also talk a bit about your actual research, because I, 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 as I said, in the States, we don't really hear a lot about Eastern Africa. Um, we do, we hear more, um, at least in terms of like Afro diasporic discussions about Western Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, um, but we don't hear a ton about Eastern Africa. We don't really hear that much in general um, about colonial struggle in Eastern Africa, at least in the, you know, in the U.S. And so I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about your work um, and how you think that some of the lessons learned from what you study can be applied um, in our current day struggles that are ongoing against the imperial powers that that be. Yeah, um, so for me, um, I think uh, Eastern Africa, um, especially the specific area that I study, which is um, uh, East Central Africa, or it used to be called East Central Africa or East Equatorial Africa, which was just the space that was called the unexplored space where um, the missionaries and the colonial um, powers were least were, were last to, to enter or to penetrate as they called it. Um, and so at that uh, moment, that's when they came around like the 1840s, um, their, the colonial encounter um, between these uh, Europeans and the European um, state power in the form of the caravan and the, the, the merchants and porters, et cetera, the, mobili the mobilizing um, state, um, that was confronted by um, indigenous resistance um, around 1840s. So there were at 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, there were people that have no uh, understanding of what the state, what an imperialist colonialist state was. And so we had um, the most recent, most modern, most advanced um, forms of radical opposition to colonial to the colonial state, as opposed to places like um, so-called America, where um, the state, ha the imperial state, has existed for so long um, that it has additional normalizing effects. So we start um, like feeling it's normal and natural. Um, that's like my struggles um, in in speaking about 
uh, the American state is very often to struggle to to highlight its form as a colony because people almost seem to have a difficulty to grasp that uh, this is colonialism. Rather, they would think of it as a, a a country or just a place. And things have become like institutionalized to the point where the the lines of colonialism cannot be seen. Um, whereas in a number of places um, in Africa, especially in the in in the Nairobi, Nairobi area. Um, the colonialism is always very much a present question, and the entire state is always a question. There's still fight, fights over um, the meanings of the state and uh, questions about how to remove the state. Um, and so, obviously, in imperialist and Western dominated uh, narratives, uh, Africa becomes seen as a failed state or a state that um, hasn't uh, materialized into a proper colony like, like America. But uh, from the opposite perspective, you can see that uh, the state, the imperialist state failed um, where uh, the American state is, has been almost successful. And so if you were to think about what is, uh, what, who provides the best guides to how to continuously put the entirety of uh, white supremacist colonial power into question, uh, we would have to look at um, Africa, and we'd have to look at it, especially the, the last colonized places. Um, so not even Southern Africa, not even Western Africa, but specifically um, that East uh, Equatorial Africa. And the last places, because um, the last places uh, that were colonized were all, is also uh, the most recent um, episodes of anti-colonial uh, resistance. That's super fascinating. And I love what you said about how in the US, you know, the the lines of the colony can't be seen, right? It's like this hegemonic order, if you will, um, of the colonial state almost being settled in insofar as it cannot be seen or people don't recognize it. Some of us see it, obviously, right? Um, there are definitely people who see it, point that out, comment on it, uh, comment on it. But there's a certain degree of as you said, it being so normalized that some people can't see it or don't recognize it. And I also really appreciate what you said about kind of rethinking how we how we talk about colonialism, especially as it relates to Africa, because as you said, it's not so much that it's, it's not that it's a failed state, it's that colonialism failed. Um, and that perhaps that offers a key to, to resistance going forward. I really, really like that and appreciate that. Um, there has been some really weird stuff online lately with regard to whether or not the U.S. is a colony. Um, and as someone who studies colonialism, I'd love if you could kind of flesh that out a little bit more, too, because I think there's still some confusion about what colonialism means as an ongoing project, um, particularly as it relates, as I said, to the U.S. already, but also to places like uh, Palestine, some parts of the Sahara. Like, how do we kind of conceptualize um colonialism right now? And also, what do you think is, besides perhaps some some form of um, nationalist chauvinism or Western chauvinism, what do you think is making it so difficult for people to recognize that this is actually an, an ongoing, continuous, present-day struggle? Well, national um, chauvinism has uh, captured pretty much the entire ideological apparatus. Um, so from your family to uh, your school system, to your church, to uh, commercials on TV, um, it continuously reinforces from birth into the end of life, the idea that this is a space, this is a country, this is um, a place that um, corresponds to the settlers imagined geography. So the settlers imagined geography of like how we think of what comes to our mind when we think of the the map of the United States that is emblazoned in our consciousness. And so it becomes normal to the point, well, obviously this is the United States. Um, and so it is difficult um, to uh, think of anything other, because even though this, the that specific um, imagination has changed over years, like with the addition of Mexico and Alaska and all these other places, um, uh, we have almost a solid view of what it, what uh, the state is, whereas um, borders continue to shift in um, places like um, Kenya uh, with the addition of Uganda, uh, uh, slides of Uganda incorporated into Kenya and uh, leaving people thinking that, well, this is um, whether this really this area is really um, Kenyan or not. The, the, the question of uh, the ge geography is continuously put into question uh, by people on the ground in a way that it doesn't always seem to 
to be in for the dominant population in America. Obviously, um, anyone that is interested in indigenous uh, sovereignty and indigenous activism or, or anti-colonialism um, from the indigenous perspectives and other perspectives, the entire project is to question uh, this imagined geography. But um, because they have um, power over uh, all forms of uh, representation, um, because it is their schools, it is their churches, it is their uh, indoctrinated families that continue to reproduce the idea that the state is as we say it is, as the settlers say it is, um, then it is a very difficult um, battle to, to, to ride against that. Um, whether that the U.S. is a colony, I mean, it's, uh, for me, it's a very simple, simple matter, actually. It's just that, okay, well, they called it a colony. Um, there was 13 colonies. It was pretty much clear to everybody it was a colony. And they came to <laughs> colonize, to uh, take territory, to take property, to do a whole bunch of colonial type of things. And they didn't change that. The, the, the fundamental order of society that they set up, um, not to say nothing about how many times their judges and their um, their court transcripts and their schools again, and, and everyone continues to say, like from uh, uh, for hundreds of years, um, that this is uh, our space, white space, etc., um, colonial space in the early centuries. Um, all of that is, is is there has been a continuous line that this is a colony since uh, the first people um, uh, set up the colony. Um, the reason that some people kind of get confused is because uh, they have believed um, in the uh, certain group of settlers uh, that say that they have got independence from um, another group of settlers. And to say that um, basically that uh, we have been colonized um, and we, re we had our independence from the British. But obviously from the perspective of the subaltern, the marginalized and people who were under the thumbs of uh, colonial power, um, black and indigenous people, um, that type of logic doesn't hold. It would be the same thing to say that, okay, well, um, the Afrikaners got independence from uh, uh, Britain. Um, so then therefore uh, the apartheid state is not a colony anymore. And that wouldn't make sense, but it makes sense for so many over here, because again, of the power of the nationalist uh, chauvinist, as you, as you describe it, um, claim and colonization of all ideology, all thought, all modes of representation. I'm just uh, trying to be as much of a sponge as possible. I find this all incredibly interesting and having I've mentioned before, just being deprived of so much of just the, the plethora of knowledge out of Africa learning about this and finding out more uh, about your work is just uh, led me to be incredibly curious about particularly uh, something uh, I see you describe as anti-colonial anarchism before anarchism big A. And uh, I guess before we go uh, deeper into other things, I'm curious if you could just expand a little bit on about your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, Anarchism, um, if it is to uh, to evolve or to be useful, um, to be useful or to be effective, has to evolve into um, uh, the indigenous anti-colonial anarchism of um, the of of the place we were be, we've been talking about, um, East Equatorial Africa, etc. So, because very often, like uh, again, as an as a secondary effect of um, the power of the West and the West being central, Eurocentric city, etc., um, even uh, resistance movements very often find themselves falling into the trap of saying, "Okay, well, let's look at what uh, Bakunin um, did um, or was saying, and that should be the template for more modern um, anarchist movements." Um, obviously, there are people, a lot of anarchists themselves would, would, would disagree with that or would look to, and they consider to say that they look at other places. Uh, but it seems that um, most of the colonized world, if not all of the colonized world, um, was in its very existence an, an antithesis to the state. Um, and so the colonial encounter was a moment where uh, the anarchist possibilities were this pretty much clear and, and evident. Um, because when a caravan uh, full of Europeans with the with um, flogging whips and proclamations of law and um, 
uh, sense of order and uh, desire to align uh, and to rule uh, entered into uh, the space of indigeneity. Um, it was met, at least in East, um, East, East Africa, um, East Central Africa, it was met with um, the native, as they call it, the native war cries in the darkness in the bushes um, and poison arrows coming from every which way. So hostile savagery, as they called it, um, the, the, the darkness um, that was uh, at all angles against uh, the state, the light of uh, European civilization that was manifested in a caravan coming into the, to the hinterland. Um, that absolute um, antithesis of uh, the state existed in its purest form in pretty much all uh, colonies. And so we wouldn't have to go and look up um, the writings of, of Bakunin as useful as they are, um, and as important as they are, because obviously modes of life has changed, and so uh, we need to read and think about people who have experienced um, the state, and so anarchism from within the state is always important. Um, but uh, the entire library of, of, of anarchy um, is in the colonial world, because it is the, uh, the move away from the state. So it's not so much that um, uh, Africa um, has to learn about the anarchy from the West, but that Africa is anarchic. It is just that uh, the Western power continues to make uh, the, the thought worlds of, of African peoples um, who have written their literature with uh, arrows shot against the Europeans um, in caravan, uh, that is not read. Um, that history, that experience, that is not consulted. Uh, we intend to look for people that have codified um, their anarchism in, in books. Thank you for that. That is uh, very enlightening. And uh, pairing that with what you've already mentioned about the recency of the colonialist or the colonialism and the ongoing uh, colonizing is uh, enlightening to just kind of really just confront in my mind uh, for the first time in many ways, how that uh, can affect the ability to perceive that the line that you've been discussing. And that's just, uh, it's, I appreciate that. Thank you. Definitely. Cool, cool. Um, I wanted to add to just like, just listening to you guys talk about this, um, you know, one of the, or two of the people that come to mind immediately um, in relation to your work are Aimé Césaire and Fanon. Um, and I'm not sure how much you engage them, especially considering your, I know your work is a bit later, but on a theoretical level, um, I certainly am hearing some reverberations going on here, um, especially with regard to how to think about um, politics and ideology through a different set of frameworks and from recognizing perhaps the third world or the colonized world as a space for this kind of activity and how much people can learn from them as opposed to the other way, as opposed to the other way around that sort of um, unfortunately ends up replicating a lot of colonial models of learning and things like that. But on that note, um, I wanted to kind of hear from you about your personal experiences, if you're willing to share them um, as someone who's working on this in an academy that's otherwise well known for being a, a sort of colonized space in and of itself. Um, and if you could talk about maybe if there are challenges or, or sort of things that you're pushing up against with your own work and perhaps even your own personal standpoint as someone who's, who's from the Caribbean um, and who's working on an area that's like very much dominated by, you know, um, colonizing apparatuses, but also just like U.S. imperialism, Western imperialism, a lot of French imperialism. Uh, what does it mean for you to be a scholar who's thinking in this way in these spaces that are very much um, kind of replications of, of what you're fighting against? Yeah, um, well, it's almost as if like I don't, I notice it, but I don't notice it. Um, and the reason I say that is that like I, came into academia with very um very low expectations um so i like for me it's not so much that a problem like okay i'm trying to do anti-colonial thought but i'm pushed up against um an an unwelcoming uh colonial institution 
Um, that is entirely the case, but that's that is it's less surprising to me. It's, it's less of a conflict because it's almost as if, like I, because I used to work as a telemarketer and I used to work as a person in the factory, and both of those jobs I didn't feel like conflicted because I was in that um, that space that I couldn't really do things that I that I want. It's just that um, uh, this place is generally hostile to some and especially someone like me that believes the things that I do. Um, and so that's just <laughs> how it's always been um, since my entire existence. So um, I think that uh, academia continues to um, mythologize itself into, uh, for a lot of the people that are, are even resisting it, um, into that there should be, because it is um, so uh, uh, open to, open to thought, it should be um, that, uh, uh, freedom to think and be otherwise would be welcome. Um, but that is in itself, uh, there, there should not be any more reason to believe that um, the academy is more welcoming than uh, McDonald's. Um, they are the entire, they're basically the same institution. And so I'm coming from a tradition of generally um, surviving and uh, existing um, just along the way. Like um, my mother uh, worked as an accountant and um, she had to basically uh, move around to not get uh, kicked out by a racist woman that didn't like her for, for, for obvious reasons. Um, and so um, she had to survive and to do her, her life, um, help us to, to exist, me and my sister, um, in that uh, space. So that is just a tradition that I continue. Like I, because I didn't set up, I didn't have the belief that the academy would be um, would be welping, welcoming. Um, there was not really too much to 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 be conflicted with. It's always just been like I'm walking into the state and let me survive at the, and do as much as I can or I'm allowed to. Like everybody that I've ever known in my entire life has been doing here. Yeah, that makes sense. It's unfortunate, uh, but that definitely makes sense. Um, and I'm, I don't know, like part of me wants to be like, I'm sorry you have to deal with that, but I also can reflect and understand it because I feel it myself as well. Um, so I'm, I'm sharing that struggle with you, uh, that internal struggle too. Um, I wanted to ask you kind of on the note of academia as well. Um, you know, one of the things that comes up here and there is the question of like how to think of um, African indigenous peoples within a larger set of studies about indigeneity and how they're often left out um, and how when we talk about indigeneity in the United States, normally, I mean, we're, we're thinking about the United States as, an, as a spot where, you know, we have indigenous groups and we're thinking just about those indigenous groups, um, which is fine. Like it, it is what it is. But I, I'm just curious about what your feelings are on whether or not um, you know, indigenous studies in the United States or perhaps Europe should expand to um, consider more of what indigeneity means in an African context, perhaps uh, in an Asian context, um, and where you see that field going. If you've had any interaction with it, even um, you know, how do you how does your own work fit within that, if if at all? Um, so for me. Uh... Well, I'll say that a lot of uh, what is understood to be indigenous is only indigenous um, or has been made indigenous directly because of relationship to colonial power. So um, that people were people, um, but they've been identified as um, natives. And because they were identified as natives, they were treated in a specific ways by the colonial state. Um, and so there were natives um, in, in, in the Americas, there was natives in, in Kenya and in, in Africa, natives pretty much everywhere. Um, and so a lot of indigenous movements have uh, recognized the specific forms of dispossession and violence visited upon, upon them. And so have mobilized and uh, begun to think in terms of indigenous um, uh, struggle, just like um, uh, black and, and indigenous uh, slash indigenous or, or black um, without the indigenous qualification, people have been questioning, even though they've been made black, they've been uh, mobilizing through blackness. I have no problem with that. And I think that we need more of it. Um, but indigeneity, uh, because it's related to colonialism and because it also, because, uh, because it's related to colonialism is also related to colonial geographies. And so um, the wards that the colonial state has set up 
have sometimes bled into our own ways of thinking about um, what the world is. But if you think of, for example, um, forced migrations of um, indigenous people, very often called, um, at least one incident called the Trail of Tears. Um, well, there were transatlantic um, trails of tears. That's the entirety of what uh, the slave ships uh, did. Uh, very often it was uh, indigenous peoples that were forced, uh, African indigenous peoples that were forced onto um, boats um, and to and mig forced and migrated um, elsewhere. Um, the ocean, um, the Atlantic or, or other oceans, are not um, just there. They are only divisions uh, because of our sense of cartography, which is very often influenced by imperial cartography. But the the colonial power that forces indigenous people to move and labor or to uh, or to um, abuse them in other places, um, those things are a constant of colonialism. Um, they force people to move in South Africa. They force people to South Africa to move to another place in South in what is understood to be South Africa. They force people in the Ivory Coast to move to to Alabama, and they force um, people um, in South Dakota to move um, elsewhere. So the, the what is important is like for me, I am not against even indigenous studies excluding um, uh, Africa, um, but I like for its own purposes. What I am um, against, and although this is not <laughs> my focus in general, uh, what I am against is the inability to recognize that the same anti-indigenous forces that operated in the in Turtle Island or in um, uh, Canada and America, the same exact forces and techniques and purposes uh, define um, the work against uh, Black peoples um, in the transatlantic slave trade. So indigenous, indigenous uh, anti-indigenous violence um, is visited on um, African peoples and continues to be um, uh, visited on African peoples in Africa and in America. Um, but obviously, because of the different purposes that uh, certain populations were put to, uh, Black populations being uh, uh, forced into certain ways and indigenous in other ways, um, there's numbers of different adapted forms of power that were visited on them. But of course, um, even that needs to be broken down too, because one indigenous uh, population um, was not treated like another indigenous population, just like a slave in Alabama was not treated like a slave in New York. All of these things have to be um, uh, thought and it should not, we should not rely on the easy segregations of, um, uh, or at least the, the nativist native um, understandings of, of anti-indigenous violence. I think that's really clarifying because especially that last part uh, that you mentioned uh, with regard to sort of not losing sight of the differences between indigenous groups and indigenous experiences, but also understanding from a systemic side that they're that the, the suffering that they're going through is often being meted out by a lot of the same forces. I think that you I believe it was in the same article, actually, where you you mentioned the the sort of extended metaphor of a trail of tears, right? Applying to all of these other instances of colonial violence. And one of the things I believe you mentioned in that same article is that you also have a kind of um, extended long form metaphor with regard to Holocaust language as well, um, which I thought was really important. And I know is sometimes controversial just because we've, we've gotten to the point where, you know, we recognize that the Holocaust in and of itself is a very it's obviously a tragic situation. It was a preventable situation. It was a series of genocidal violence um, that went on for years and affected millions of people. But what's interesting is that I think, um, you know, in your article and, and some other things that other people have mentioned is that there's not a trademark on this sort of genocidal violence and that it has been enacted upon um, quote unquote colonized peoples for some time now and we have to kind of get to the point where we're recognizing that this extends far beyond Nazism. Um, not only that, but obviously the Nazis, as some people are beginning to discover through archival records and whatnot, have been and were influenced by a lot of the, the segregation practices, Jim Crow practices, practices against um, indigenous and black people in the United States those practices were often applied to as a result from from this sort of, uh, you know, like imperial interaction or education process. 
it was impl- applied to people of Jewish and Roma and other descent. Um, so I don't know, could you talk a bit about, if you can recall uh, that article and your commentary on, you know, where we're, where we are right now with regard to white supremacist violence and how widespread it is, but why people in this country can't seem to call it what it is when they see it. Like there's almost a kind of myopia around a uh, linguistic myopia, at least around, around what's going on and actually confronting it and calling it what it is. Yeah. So I'm actually not sure which article you're talking about, but I definitely get down like that often. So um, I probably said it once or twice in different places. Yeah. Um, I think it's, but, I can tell you specifically, yeah. I'm sorry. It's the one it's called, it was something that you wrote for Al Jazeera back in September of 2020. Um, it's called on Kenosha and the difficulty of recognizing Nazism mm-hmm. in the United States. Yeah. Well, um, to, to, to speak about um, the Holocaust specifically, um, like I definitely grew up um, in black nationalist, pan-Africanist um, circles and a term very often used, um, I think it's actually a Kiswahili term, um, is the mafa, um, which is um, a term uh, that describes a large, um, horrific, uh, genocidal uh, catastrophe. Um, I did, they didn't use genocidal, but it was catastrophe. Um, to describe what has happened for the last uh, like half a millennia um, uh, to Black people. Um, and so uh, the MAFA and the Holocaust um, kind of, like it's, to translate it, it would be to just to, to speak about a Holocaust, um, a, a mass um, uh, sacrificing, etc. cetera. Um, I think one of the reasons why, if it is controversial, it is controversial because um, the, of that same uh, politics that uh, continue to make black lives not matter. Um, black life um, continues to be um, invisible. Um, the sufferings continue to uh, be rendered historical or um, marginal, or just like um, the pain um, of a black person's skin was understood to be uh, less uh, less susceptible to black people's skins were less susceptible to pain. They were considered more like hides um, for, so the same uh, uh, denial of black suffering um, operates in general in white supremacist um, worldview. Um, And so, and so obviously um, to think that uh, black people for the last 500 years haven't gone through a slow uh, killing catastrophe and, and, um, in a number of cases, genocide <clears throat> would be ridiculous to anyone who uh, uh, browsed um, uh, Black history. Um, and so, yes, there is no trademark, and I don't know why uh, anyone <laughs> would want to be uh, making a trademark <laughs> of this specific um, uh, problem. Um, so inherent in the inability to be able to um, see uh, Black violence and Black suffering, uh, anti-Black violence and Black suffering, um, is an inability to be able to uh, recognize um, what uh, a state that continues to uh, uh, force Black people to to suffer and and continues to enact anti-Black violence um, is. You can't really see um, (laughs) the state as violent if its victims are not um, seen as as suffering. That's, it's just <laughs> almost just a, a, a logical problem. Um, and so uh, people continuously are shocked of what is now called the fascism of the state, as if this is like some type of new thing that is happening. But of course, um, the anti-Blackness, the totalitarianism of the plantation, the authoritarianism of parole, um, the display and physical tortures um, that has happened through all of the colony's um, existence. Um, that is evidence of a long mafia, a long um, halka. So what Cesaro once said, I think in Discourse of Colonialism, is that what, um, what Hitler and Hitlerism is, is colonialism uh, washed back onto the shores of Europe. Um, what uh, the mass extermination of of people in Europe is, 
is the uh, continuation of the mass inter extermination of peoples in Europe's colonies. Um, and so um, if one is to take an account and one is worried about uh, the potential of uh, increased genocidal practice, European-led genocidal practice, um, one cannot uh, begin with what happened in Europe. One has to think about um, uh, all of its experimental genocidal practices. And that includes uh, Africa, uh, Asia, um, uh, the Americas, etc. Um, to deny this Holocaust, to be a Holocaust denier um, when it comes to Black people, is only to set oneself up from not knowing the uh, the monstrosity of the state. The line about uh, Hitler and Nazism being uh, colonialism washing back on on Europe's shores was just. Uh, resonated with me but uh one of the things that had come to my mind during this conversation is just uh between the recency and the anti-black violence and uh my recent kind of understanding over the last five or so years of the importance of haiti in anti-colonial struggle and i was just wondering if uh both historically and contemporarily if uh you had some insight uh, on what's been transpiring in Haiti and how that fits into kind of what we've been discussing so far. I'm not up to date on what's been happening in, in Haiti. I, for me, it's, I, I don't know if I fear learning more about it or, um, or, or, or what, because it took me like months after um, an earthquake um, for me to actually kind of read any news reports. On it. I have like a, a, a intimate connection with Haiti um for a number of reasons but one is because of uh the hope that it provided um for black people to escape um or to be a so haiti was like a maroon island where black people could escape and leave uh the that space of uh colonialist repression pretty much everywhere else after the haitian revolution um and so haiti has for me been a continuous rebellion against um, the state and whatever um, uh, guards and wards they put in, in terms of um, uh, leaders and uh, taxes and forcible uh, reparations of money, etc. Um, it's just been a long string of uh, violence, um, of colonial violence um, that has been resisted and in some ways resisted more spectacularly and successfully than anywhere else. Um, but in terms of what possibility that I feel that Haiti can, can serve, um, instead of looking towards, for example, what hope Haiti um, can, can um, provide, I, so instead of looking at the civil rights um, movement as the, um, the origin story for um, Black struggle and Black protest, finding a, a, a line from Martin Luther King or something like that. Obviously, uh, nobody really does that. But there has definitely been a platforming of the civil rights movement um, uh, by dominant media, dominant um, liberal thinkers in terms of understanding um, a Black struggle. Instead of having to draw from that specific history, we can, again, blur and remove ourselves from the imperialist um, cartography and think about Black struggles um, elsewhere especially in Haiti. Um, and what that struggle meant, what type of hopes for freedom were then? And were they only knocking at the door, um, hoping for change? Uh, were they only knocking at the door, hoping for a reorganized American society or a Haitian society? Or was there um, an imagination um, that, was, uh, that was anchored in the possibility of an absolute absence of white supremacist control, um, uh, absolute uh, absence of white supremacist governance. Um, and then obviously uh, hopes to root out, decolonize um, uh, the legacies of white supremacist culture. Um, because that might be a more useful template than those that begin with um, thinking about uh, one specific geographical location and saying that um, uh, freedom must follow these traditions. No, um, there is no reason to think that um, our freedom is dependent on a colonial geography. 
uh, we can think and include uh, thinkers and actors of freedom anywhere, from anywhere. Um, and we do not need to be holding to uh, any type of uh, liberal historical trajectory of, of Black life. That, that trajectory, that narrative of the progress of, of Black struggle uh, has policing effects on our imagination and what can be thought in terms of struggle. Um, but if we were to uh, depart from that and actually I think, well, you know what? I'm going to replace my MLK statue with my Dessaline statue. Um, I think more radical dreams of freedom uh, will be evident. And we'll also see how deep the emergency that we've been in for 400 and so years um, is. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate the the reference to kind of the imagination and the not letting ourselves be limited by the imagined geographies of colonialism. And I, it, it echoes what I've been hearing, thinking and reading about uh, recognizing our reality is constructed by us. And so that if we want, an, if we want a different one, that we can be an active member in constructing that. And that takes imagining something different and better, but uh, I'll pass it back to Wendy now. I mean, some of the things you said, both of you actually, um, make me kind of, kind of, I don't know, go right into the question that I was going to ask. So that's perfect. Um, but I had just a general question about marinage and like maroon, the idea of the the maroon space and where, um, if any, if any opportunities nowadays, where that might be and what that might look like. Um, I know it's something you've written about, um, but I'm I'm curious to know not only from a historical standpoint, but perhaps thinking about um, the present where you might see a space for like a modern marinage. What does that look like for you, Yannick? Um, so you mentioned Fanon before. And for me, um, Fanon, um, in terms of uh, the, cl the colonial libraries or the textual libraries, Fanon is the person that I uh, go back to over and over again, um, because uh, he represents um, anti-colonial struggle um, the thought of anti-colonial struggle for me in a way that really resonates with me. And I think it's just objectively um, great, um, specifically Wretched of the Earth. Um, but above Fanon, above anti-colonial struggle, the struggle that has to be waged um, within the state, um, marunage seems to be a more pure expression, um, that it is not a, a wrestling with the state, but it is an entire uh, abandonment of the state and uh, moving away from the space of the state to be able to whether strike the state later on or just to find a form of life that is that exists out uh, without the state um without it both senses and um obviously uh the uh, next level the its purest form is um the uh hostile savagery of the the say kukuyu um um in the hinterland uh, where the state is not even recognized as a state. It is just an intrusion that needs to be dealt with. Um, and so uh, in because uh, there is no real point in actually imagining um, a place, I mean, there might be some point to it, but um, imagining a place where we have had any contact uh, with the state and we cannot recognize this form because that might just be impossible now. Um, Marinage is uh, the next best hope. Um, to recognize the state and to move away from it. Now, uh, <laughs> to not get too philosophical here, um, it is, it is, there's one way of looking at, um, geography and to, uh, recognize that there's nowhere that the state actually occupies, like the country is not really material. Um, and so therefore, um, space and distance might not really operate. What, it, what needs to be, um, what needs to be uh, considered is to what extent or how wide is the reach of colonial power? Not so much uh, do we leave with our feet to another place, but what exactly is the reach of colonial power? Um, and to escape, to abandon, and to remove oneself from the state uh, might be physical, but um, uh, when uh, capitalist and colonial hegemony has covered the earth, also might be intellectual. And this is where anti colonialism and marinage kind of meet for me. Um, one needs to remove oneself from uh, patriotism. One needs to remove oneself from 
uh, that sentimental and effect and and the affect of um, the colony, uh, which is um, understood as patriotism in terms of love, but also just uh, the uh, acknowledgement and embracing of the colonial geography. One must remove oneself from that, from that, and to be a maroon from the uh, this the intellectual uh, sphere and the dominating um, thought processes of the colony, and to see the state, even the one that you are existing in, as far away. To be able to imagine oneself fundamentally far away, um, and I mean I don't not necessarily in terms of reactions, but literally to have no ties to the state, to put the entire state in question and to act and operate and in the recognition that the state is transient and the states will go away. This white supremacist state will go away. And to build one's politics based on that, rather than um, in some way, even though being angry at the state or saying the state is in, uh, unjust, to kind of work and try to make the state better or try to, or to have hope and faith that the state will improve. The maronage is the uh, belief um, that is put into practice, the belief that states will not improve, improve in time, and therefore it must be abandoned and resisted to the point where um, one breaks all emotional. That should be um, the starting point of, the, um, of, of, of our politics, I suggest, even more so than um, a workers' um, politics that, wanted, that has a class revolution. The, the, when you imagine the workers as still part of the state, uh, one does not move as far away as the people that moved from the plantation to the heights of uh, uh, John Crow um, mountains in Jamaica. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm laughing because like, yeah, that's a really good point. You know, I think it's, it's in some ways, I mean, it, it goes back to your discussion with Richard about the political imagination, right? Like how limited are our views of self and perhaps our own potential if we can only see see some sort of freedom within the boundaries of the state still, right? What does that what does that mean about our own um I don't know, self estimation or something? It's kind of an, an interesting thing to think about. Um I'm curious this, this is my last question, uh, but obviously, Richard, feel free to jump in whenever uh, towards the end here. But I'm I'm curious to know about what you're doing now, if you're willing to speak to us about it, because I know there's sometimes uh, it's difficult if you're in the middle of research or whatever to talk about it uh, in a clear way. But if you're willing to tell us, uh, what are you working on now? And if you have anything coming up in the future that people should be on the lookout for? Um, so to... To tell you the truth, um, I don't know what I'm working on now. I think I operate not as a proper scholar um, or a scholar at all. Um, most of the articles that I've been able to to, to write and publish um, are just reactions, one to some egregious act or some um, uh, nonsense that I heard on TV, um, or just the um, inability or the 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 absence of um, my voice being widely available. Obviously, um, another thing that I've ever said is is new. You can find it in books, in libraries, um, in radical discussion circles, pretty much everywhere. But I've been angry at least for at least five ten years because when I'm just randomly um, scrolling or putting uh, the, the television on, um, it's always uh, liberal nonsense that. Um, just attacks me, and that's what I end up working on. I'm, I work. I write an essay because I'm mad that my what I want to be said, or at least a, a challenging to um, a liberal opinion, is just not there. Or I'd have to look for it somewhere else. Like Toni Morrison said that if you don't find a novel that you want to read, um, you have to write it, and that's basically been like my whole philosophy with the writing. So I, 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 I I'm hoping that I'm going to get a break and be able to do some scholarly stuff like that is important, but um, I just, I, I, I act <laughs> largely out of anger. Um, one thing that I am trying to pull together and we will see if this happens is I do want to set up um, a type of multimedia um, uh, like uh, program 
or a series um, that kind of interviews different black radicals um, in, in like around the world. Um, one of the uh, one of my most angry or, or, or passionate articles was one called "Black Liberal, Your Time Is Up." And it was a culmination of of, of anger that uh, the black liberals that are being interviewed on CNN, black professors being uh, given platforms to speak, have always been representing a radical struggle uh, to the world and 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 putting it in uh, liberal terms. And uh, there was like, it's hard to find like a, a black radical on the most dominant um, media platforms. And so I just want to hear more and I would love to be able to set up a media multimedia program slash podcast slash um, uh, space uh, for black radical visibility. Um, that's just something that I need for my own just uh, well-being. I can certainly empathize there. <laughs> I, I, <feel laughs> <Yeah. that. laughs> Both of us, I think. <laughs> uh, very much of uh, my engagement politically uh, in public has been as a result of, as I mentioned earlier, just kind of being uh, denied a lot of the information that we've been discussing here and just kind of the understanding and the historical context of the world around me. And knowing that how easy it is for the, the other people to have that happen. I just wanted to do whatever I could to help uh, alleviate that. And so I, I'm definitely supportive of, of your mission there in every, any and every way I can. Uh, I guess one of the things, <laughs> you know, oh, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that came to my mind, uh, I guess just in, uh, before we let you go uh, was you uh, in the Al Jazeera piece, you talked a little bit about the historical use of unity in the United States. And I just wondering if you could uh, discuss that a little bit. Yeah. So for me, um, I have not seen any unity um, announced from the seats of power in the colony. That uh, was a unity with, let's say um, the uh, Maroons, uh, the, the, quote unquote, American Maroons, I'm um, unity with uh, Black uh, Panthers or nothing like that. I've never seen a unity that was intended to be a unification with uh, the people that had our, our survival and best interests at heart. It's always been a unity between and among uh, white supremacists. Um, the, the, the end of the Civil War was, um, and, and the end of Reconstruction was, a compromise between uh, Southern racists and Northern racists um, that was on the backs of, uh, of the, or as they put it, like through the ribs of the, um, of, of Black people. Uh, it was like, it was clear that Black people were going to uh, bleed and, and die because of the compromise in the civil, and the, um, after the Civil War and the Reconstruction. Um, same with uh so also settler settler white supremacist unity imaginaries of unity always imagine the a colonial future and colonial futurity um and that colonial future anti indigenous and anti black um so there is so unity and it is a unity for the solidification and um um strength of an imperialist state, which is obviously going to use that strength where it exists, where uh, we are not, as they used to call us, the intestinal um, enemies of the state, uh, where that has been uh, suppressed and there is some type of uh, social peace that leads to uh, state power, that state power is imperialist and will continue imperialist things. Um, so unity um, is imagined as a good thing by liberals who have faith that imperialism can be worked out for the benefit of many people. And um, well, that's it, basically. <laughs> Unity is basically a, 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 a liberal uh, fantasy that requires um, a, a misrecognition of Black life and Black suffering. Um, I am not for uh, the continued uh, good operation of imperialist states. And <laughs> because I am for uh, the survival of Black life, and those things always run that ahead. So unity for me 
um, is a threat. Appreciate that. And I think it ties in well with the idea of imagining and existing as oneself outside of, uh, you know, association and limitations of the state uh, to the degree. And so I just want to again, thank you uh, for everything and pass it to Wendy. Yeah, agreed. Thank you so much for talking to us. This is really enlightening and like, I think a refreshing take on a lot of things. Um, again, with regard to our own political imaginations as well. I, I learned a lot from this talk and again, appreciate your time. Um, where can people check your workout um, and also just your everyday opinions? Um, so I'm only, I'm very new to to all of this. So I'm, I'm only on one social media site, uh, Twitter, and I'm at Further Black. And um, I have a website, yannickmarshall.net, um, where I just post like almost like an index of my latest um, writing. Um, but like, if you can just uh, look for uh, a piece by me um, whenever you're interested. I like have anything more orchestrated than that. Um, one day I will, but um, again, this whole world is extremely new to me. Always, it's good that it's new to you because I think you're less jaded at that point, right? You can, you have a little bit more uh, freedom, and and I think also just like it, it, it feels more fresh and not as cynical. You know, I think sometimes when you're in this social media space for long enough, uh, it kind of rots your brain. So I think in some ways it's probably good that you're new to all of it uh, because you definitely, what you provided us today was refreshing and, and awesome to hear. So really, again, much appreciation. Um, I hope that people check out your work. They definitely should. Your stuff in Al Jazeera has been banging. Uh, you've had a lot of stuff about uh, U.S. politics, imperialism, things like that, that people should definitely check out. But also your dissertation is there. There's some other more academic stuff that, you, that you've written that's there as well that people should definitely take a look at. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much, Yannick. Be safe. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening to the Left Pocket Project podcast. As always, just as a reminder, please be sure to find us on social media at LeftPOC and to check out the Patreon page, and that's patreon.com slash LeftPOC, where you can find everything for free and always, always, always. Um, But of course, we take donations. If you are so inclined, a dollar or more per month helps keep this boat afloat. Um, And also, just really as another quick reminder, Comrade Mommy is still on, so there will be a new episode soon of Comrade Mommy. I will be talking about um, women and labor and domestic work. Um, So be sure to check that out and uh, any of the previous episodes. And yeah, I hope everyone's staying safe. Much love and hope to you and your families. And uh, yeah, everyone be safe. Have a good one.